I mean, um, obviously, it's an occasion I celebrate, but um, maybe we'll just dive in with the third talk that Mark was doing. You can come forward also. Thanks. Um, yeah, so okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, KPZ, super critical KPZ with a uh, long range causation. Um, and it's a uh, joint work with Shubei, B, um, and our joint PhD students with the drama. Um, and well, maybe first I should start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, on that big occasion to celebrate uh, Jeremy. Um, looking forward to many more years of great projects with him. I mean, obviously, I've known Jeremy for a long time. I think we first met in Hyderabad, uh, something like a conference for the, uh, for the ICM there. Uh, he was carrying a very precious WhatsApp with him. I'll hear you can ask him about that story. Uh, anyway, the great thing you have is the option to put that on the ear post the pandemic. <laughs> Um, okay, so right, so so KPD was not very interesting. So basically, so what's the model we start from? Right, so we start from uh, the KPD equation. So let me write this. The uh, P equation plus gradient H square. Uh, plus some noise, and the noise we're interested in is going to have long range correlation. So we assume that that guy is not in time, delta in S, and it has some uh, spatial correlation. And the spatial correlation here is new, uh, and it's <laughs> and it decays slowly, right? So you should think of R as being something R of X is a gold line X in a kappa, okay? uh, so it's bounded and smooth, uh, but it decays like a, a slow power. Uh, so maybe it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe the first question we should ask is what's the interesting ranges of kappa? Okay. Uh, so here we dimension D. Right? So think of X D. And D is always going to be greater than equal to three. So so the first thing you sort of realize is that Kappa basically plays the role of a sort of defective dimension, right? Um, because if you if you took white noise of the of the compact to support it, right? So take an R which has short length correlation of the so compact to support it exponentially decaying or something like this, um, then in some sense, you know, delta functions in dimension D sort of scale like one of x to the d. Okay. So in some sense, kappa equal to d would sort of correspond to the case where the correlation here is short range. So kappa bigger than d uh, is basically the same as if it was compact to support. Right? So the interesting case here is kappa less than d. Um, and then if kappa is less than two, uh, then you could actually uh, construct, you can construct a solution to this equation with a noise that has you know, really the least potential uh, as its covariance, so that has exactly x to the minus kappa, so for kappa less than 2, uh, you can construct that. Uh, and 2 is exactly the borderline where solutions start to be random distributions uh, rather than random functions. 
So uh, in dimension, right? So you know that maybe those of you who know about KPZ with sort of so short range correlations that in dimension two uh, it shifts the borderline where if this was place sent by noise, the free field was in dimension two is a random distribution like almost a random function. Right? If it were any more regular, it would be a random function. Uh, in less regular, it's a random distribution. Um, and so in dimension below two, which means for kappa less than two, if you write the cohort transform, right, so put uh, H, you can write it with that, you can write the view. Uh, so the cohort transform gives me the PTU which plus mu plus mu times theta is formally, then this equation makes perfect sense into sense uh, if theta is noise that has to the correlation is going back to the kappa and kappa is less than um, And then you could ask yourself so long range behavior of that, and that's a very hard problem. We're not going to solve that. <clears throat> so the range that we're going to consider is therefore kappa in two in the interval two d. Okay. In the sense that if it's bigger than d, uh, then you expect this to be the same as the R is constantly supported. Uh, and if it's less than two, then you're actually in the subcritical rather than the supercritical regime. Um, and the situation is completely different. And there you expect to have maybe some, you know, very long trivial <laughs> scaling limit, which would be an analog of the be an X point, uh, which was, you know, terribly and cause was constructed uh, seven, eight years ago. So that would be for kappa less than two. Okay, that you would have some sort of complicated nonlinear object that would try to uh, large scale behavior. And so if you're in the supercritical regime, so for kappa bigger than two, you expect the large scale behavior to be trivial. Okay. And what we expect here triviality. Um, triviality in this business means usually some fixable cash. Either Gaussian or something that can be built out of Gaussian things in a somewhat straightforward way. Right? There's no much better definition of signality, but something that would be large. Um, and so that's actually what we're going to show. Right? And so let me maybe write the result. Right, so the theorem is the following. So we look at uh, the usual uh, scale. Well, so what is the correct scaling in uh, for H? Right? So the usual scaling at large scale would be intuitive scaling in space time. And then you have to think a little bit about how to scale H itself. Uh, the natural way of scaling H itself here would be the one where you pretend the right. So since it's supercritical, you expect the nonlinearity to be somewhat irrelevant on large scales, and you, so you should be able to guess the scaling by just you know deleting the nonlinearity uh, and seeing under which scaling does the linear equation have a scaling. Right? And so if you do that calculation. You find that what you have to do is well, you do your usual diffusive scaling, and then you have to multiply by epsilon to the uh, one minus half over two. Okay, and so if you were in the short range case in dimension d, it would be a one minus d over two, okay. uh, which is the one that keeps this capacity the space time of multivariate. So again, here you see that half of the is all the time. Um, so as usual, you have to uh, subtract you know, suitable constant times t. And now, okay, so you have to have to take some initial condition, right? So I have to so 
here, I think any initial condition that is already scaled in such a way that it's only one of this, okay, so one uh, page of zero act some page zero of epsilon x time, you know, the opposite of this. It's probably one, right? So there's a lot of one uh, on the scale back. Um, so now what happens is that, and that I'm going to give you a bit of bibliographic references in a second, so a similar thing happens uh, in the short range case, which is that if you just do this, then it doesn't actually converge. You have to also converge from, you have to also subtract from on a function of t, which is not actually a linear function of t, uh, and which is mostly constant. So we don't have a, so the, what we know about that is epsilon is that we know that it's of the form of epsilon of t is minus some constant times exactly this over here, epsilon to the one minus kappa over two, uh, and then plus something which is of order one um, for positive t. So this is a fixed constant. So right, so it's, this here is a constant times t. This is just a constant, okay? no constant times t, just a constant. Um, and then there's an order one term, which we believe is actually zero. Um, we can probably remove this term, but we, can't, we don't have a good term. Okay? So right now, all we know is that this is order one. Um, so if you subtract this, and then this converges, and that term goes to zero, uh, to simply the you know, solution to the stochastic heat equation, in a weak sense. The, the view, um, so it's straight to the stochastic heat equation, but now this guy is the scale invariant one. I of dx, that's y, the delta t is x, times one over x minus y to the time. Okay, so here, uh, maybe I didn't mention that, so it depends on how you interpret the symbol. Uh, so we really assume that you know, if you take r and you rescale it into the obvious way that keeps this function variant that really converges to this function. So that this little sin symbol really means up and lower bound by uh, the same constant from our asymptotic. Um, the fact that you have yep. this constant c epsilon one minus capital in that. Yeah. So is the initial data not converging to an initial data? So right. So what well, okay, so what happens? So it does converge to the initial data. So here the u zero is actually h zero. So it tells me the initial data of the SHG. So in some sense at short times, right, what happens is that you know <clears throat> this constant here, which is that the usual thickness, which is essentially the factor constant here, and then after rescaling well, you know, that's of the epsilon approximation of the other guy, uh, and here you end up with a one, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is that you, the reason for that we are constant uh, is really because you start with an initial data that's smooth, and so it doesn't quite look like the way solution does like to look like, right? And so at short times, um, this guy, like in stationarity, that guy sort of comes out with that guy, so it's not completed, there's a little bit left, but Potentially it comes about, but at short times, because you start with something smooth, it doesn't fly. And so at very short times, the thing sort of flies off uh, because that constant is sort of too big. Right? And that's an order one sort of effect. Okay? It's just kind of flying off at the initial time. The sort of stabilizes because it starts to look like a stationary thing. Okay? Does that make sense? Could you change the initial data? Right. So you could, uh, right. So you could start. So one thing you could do is, of course, instead of starting with 
you know, some fixed smooth initial data, you could take smooth initial data plus something which is kind of small at that scale, but which oscillates in exactly the right way, so that it's already locally stationary, and then you get rid of that. So you don't need some prefactor to be small? Uh, in uh, prefactor to be prefactor in Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so that's the state of the case. Thanks. So it's called beta. So beta is not the same time. Beta zero level is not the same. Yeah, thanks. Okay. The, the beta is there before rescaling by epsilon or after? Uh, it doesn't matter. Beta is there before rescaling, so it's an order one constant, right? So it's, you expect these things to have a phase transition. All right, so you open it. Um, okay, so so in terms of statement, right? So this is very similar in terms of statement uh, to what's actually known in the short range case for dimension greater than equal to three. Um, and so there, I guess the first papers that came out, so there was first there were a couple papers by like, uh, Alex, uh, Yuhu, and Rishik, and Opposite Tuni. Uh, simultaneously uh, with a paper by Mania and Unterberger, which uses completely different techniques. Uh, so we use techniques that are much closer to the probabilistic side of things rather than this QHP expansion type approach. Um, and then there's a number of other papers, so there's a series of papers by Comet, Dr. Um, then there's some papers, well, there's quite a lot of papers on the two dimensional case, also, and Nikos here has uh, contributed quite a bit with Caravan and Tigras, uh, with Caravan and <laughs> <laughs> uh, And, you know, this is the original paper from the 90s of Platini and Cancrini in the two dimensional case. Uh, now, all these papers in the three dimensional case, the statement is. Essentially, you know, essentially the same statement uh, at the end of the day with a you know space time one constant. So um, one thing that I would like to point out is that one thing that makes somehow the long range case so different is the fact that the constant here happens to be really one in the sense that it's the same constant. The constant that shows up here, which is not the case right, in the short range. Right? With the short range case, uh, you get an effective noise strength here, which is different from the thing that you get by just rescaling the original noise and the human scaling. Right? So, in the sense that you have a sort of same order contribution of the noise and the nonlinearity. Uh, here it turns out that the constant that you get on the strength of the noise is just the naive one, which is of that it's the naive one that you would have maybe sort of guessed if you didn't know about any of these results, but which is as surprising if you actually know about these results for the whole thing. Yes. Uh, um, so, so maybe let me try to give a uh, so of an interpretation of why you can actually expect that, but it's not, not at all the proof, it's not how the proof goes, uh, but just something to aid the intuition of why the long range case is a bit different from the short range case uh, in that sense. And so what you can do right, is you can just <clears throat> look at the solution to the linear equation, the reasonable one, and then plug that into the nonlinearity. And then, in terms of scaling exponent, you find that you get something which scales basically the same way as the noise. Okay. So, in that sense, the two have sort of contributions out of the same order. But what you find is that if you look at the uh, let's sort of try to do the Calculations to sort of see, see what you actually get. Right? Um, so, so, if I look at the covariance 
Maximum scale approximation to that one. Um, and so the covariant here basically behaves like well, the noise itself has a covariance um, that goes like spatial distance to the power kappa. Um, but then there is also in time, there's a delta function. Which you can sort of think like a um, one of the square. And so, in terms of space time uh, regularity, you get something like one over space time distance to the uh, top of plus two. And um, One more space and distance to the capital plus two. And then from the heat equation part to gain the degrees of regularity, which essentially increases the exponent by four to the two degrees of regularity, but we're looking at the covariant or extra. Uh, so this you would expect this to behave like an epsilon regularization plus. From parabolic space and this is uh, to the power two minus kappa. Right? So that's the usual thing that you get, like for the free field, that's like dimension, you get it from zero here, but for the free field, you get logarithmic uh, kind of covariant, and that's the phase time covariant, right? And so, therefore, if we put this into the nonlinearity, Right. So if we look at the covariance of epsilon to be on the close kappa two minus one, uh, gradient of two epsilon square, well, we get, well, there's an epsilon to the kappa minus two, and then morally, well, taking the gradient is going to make that power one down, so I'm going to get a one minus kappa, and then taking the square of models of power, so we get a two minus two kappa. Um, and now what you find is that, well, in terms of power counting, uh, you're back to uh, the methods of one kappa, get minus kappa, and what you want to get minus two minus half. Okay, so I think I, I think I made a mistake with how I'm When you take the gradient, maybe you get two. Is that right? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, exactly. But thanks. Okay. So that means what? So take the gradient, I get a minus kappa, and square it, I get a minus two kappa. Okay. Okay. And so now it scales the internal power counting. Uh, you get a minus two minus kappa, which is the same power counting we kind of started from with the noise, right? So that suggests that they're of the same order. But first, what you find is that this, as a function, it actually goes to zero right? because the sum of it is a power mass. So in terms of power counting, it's also the same order, but actually, you know, as a distribution. This guy actually goes to zero. Whereas if you did the same thing with the short range one, you get you start from something which is a delta function. You know, you do the same sort of calculation, you get again something which is an approximate delta function, and you know the power counting of such that is an approximate delta function, so it contributes in the same. Okay, so that's a part of the intuition uh, of why here you get a the same you get the naive. Constant in terms of the strength of the noise uh, rather than something that's about. 
we normalize by some kind of order one quantity from the from the number down. So does this mean that uh, you may not have to restrict beta less than beta zero? Uh no, this we still do have to restrict. Well, good much. I forgot the beta here in the beginning, so this is the beta here. Uh, but not you need it for exactly the same reason. Right? So, it's, uh, so in the sense that right, so the way uh, these groups work is to essentially start by proving some kind of homogenization result for that equation. Uh, you actually show that that equation has a stationary solution. And, you know, the proof for doing that is basically the same as in the short range case. And so it has exactly the same problem. It only works for people. You set up some fixed point problem and it's an action for people. That's exactly the same as the short range case. The draw N. So then there is no blow up at the, at the limit in this equation. Right. So then there's no blow up. Yeah. <laughs> so now you probably have a strong convergence. Well, the convergence. If you look at your rescue stage, um, you probably do, but it doesn't quite come out. Where is John converted to? Oh, that you would actually have converted to real. I could. Write this in such a way that the rescale guy really converges in probability mm -hmm. uh, so they recognize, and then the question is in the solution is the equation converges in probability rather than just in knowledge. Um, since we use the same trick that I think you actually introduced uh, about looking at the model of the Clark of and then uh, using Stein's method, it only gives you. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, okay, it's the intuition that I just presented to you would suggest that you have to go to be so. doesn't follow that intuition. The intuition is just the same as the only question, yeah, the residues risk is or the other one would be nice larger. Um, well, I think there is, but I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if there are any results. Is this supposed to be the same? Maybe the polymer, I don't think they're going to prepare for that. Oh, yeah, but you talked about the short range case. Is it known to be necessary? Yeah, there's any big There's going to be a big transition and it's going to be known. In this case, it's not clear, but it may well be. Well, okay, so at least in the case kappa equal 2, which is a little bit like the two dimensional case. Um, well, I mean, Alex was visiting um, the EDFL a few months, a couple months ago, and we had the discussion as the outcome of it was that it may well be that the two dimension for capital two, you know, that critical beta, which is whatever, two pi or so, pi or something that goes up to dimension two, doesn't seem to be there. Um, so the scaling is the same thing, where we thought it would have. But it, it doesn't seem to be a critical So then again, that's not a good way of some that's some evidence. But yeah, the evidence is so the same time as the evidence being made. Yeah. Um okay, so much time do I have? Ten minutes. Um so I just say a couple of words about the proof. So okay, so the general theme of proof is the same as in talking about the university of Um 
but we saw the, the details are different, so I want to focus on one bit that we do differently, um, which is that the homogenization result that we get on the linear equation, we actually get a homogenization result for really the fundamental solution. So normally what people do is they get a homogenization for that result for that equation, which says something like, you start that guy with something smooth, you rescale that guy, you start with something smooth, um, or even constant, and then you look at large times and you get a stationary solution. Um, so what we show is we can actually start that guy with the delta function, and you get the following. So, uh, so let me write W x y the x for the fundamental solution solution to uh, this equation here. Right? That's the fundamental solution to the multiplicative this that the heat equation. Um, so what we know, well, let me just first state the uh, classical result. Right? The classical result is if I take the solution to this equation and I start with initial condition one, okay, so I write say, here, I take u zero constant in place equal to one, then uh, there exists a process that be an x which is stationary in space time, uh, so that if I look at u of dx and I compare the z of dx, uh, say in LP, LP in probability, then this goes to zero, this goes like some inverse power of p equals to infinity. Okay, I don't remember what power it was. So it really matters, so it goes to zero. Okay, so there's some stationary, so this guy is stationary, in case of an ion, um, so that you have that convergence. Again, for beta less than from beta c, okay? Um, now, what well, this would somehow, but what this shows, if you if you start now instead of starting with initial condition one, you start with something that varies very slowly. And what we expect, we expect that the solution looks like the heat kernel applied to that very slowly varying thing, modulated by the function z, right? And so what that will tell you. It would be a uh, WSY dx which behave like the heat kernel dt minus s of x minus y times of dx. Okay, that's actually not true. Um, and what happens is that it, you get a second process. Now, why does it say with the arrow reverse, which has to be evaluated at the initial point? And the reason why I write it said with the arrow reverse is it is just the time reversal of this process here. Okay. In the sense that this process here, it's a, you know, it's a cold cycle over the noise, if you want, right? So there's a one single kind of variable z which is say z of zero, zero, so that all the z of tx's are obtained from z of zero, zero by just shifting the noise of it, right? all in, right? Uh, so this guy is just obtained by 
take you one random variable and then shift the noise around. And this guy is obtained by taking exactly the same random variable, but first time reflecting the noise and then shift it. That makes sense. This guy is really just this guy running back in time. So, in particular, with this guy at Tx is measurable with respect to the noise that comes before T, and this guy is measurable with respect to the noise that comes after X. It's independent of what comes before X. And of course, that, you know. So that formula, that's sort of a very nice uh, expression like this. It, even though they already want to see it, it's actually not that surprising, right? Because, I mean, this thing is essentially, uh, you know, time reversal. So if you want to try to find some expression of a fundamental solution, you'd actually expect it to have some kind of time reversibility uh, and also that would stop. Um, so, Martin, that, that the yeah. reasoning does that go beyond this choice of R? Yeah, 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 that doesn't matter. Uh, so, the last proof would work also in the short range case, and you would have to say, but uh, this will be in the short range case. And actually, there's a little bit of a, um, in the, uh, I guess, in the second paper of, uh, Alex, uh, you and Opa and Daniel, you have this the optimization approach, and there you had a you had a result where you had to multiply the initial condition by something. That something would be the expectation of that guy. So, in the case where the noise is wide in time, the marking is possible to be expectation that you decided on to do one. Uh, if you took the noise. Which also has time correlations that are non trivial, and in general, the expectation of these processes could be something different than one. Uh, and then that comes in CBAR, I think that shows up in the paper, which you can be able to um, Yeah. So the right hand side depends on the entire future. So the right hand side, yes. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is approximate for P minus S law. The approximation is good if you know the start because that guy depends on the whole future, but that's a that's on the further future. Uh, so you can actually, I mean, you can get an even slightly better approximation. So there's a version of that guy that only depends on what happens between S and E and the same guy. That one that gives you a lot of approximation, but you would be looking at it. Okay, so I think I think I'm out of time. So maybe um, actually more time takes itself. I mean, this is so you know, once you have that, um, then the way the proof goes, right, is so there's this general proof, and that's the same also in the short range case, right? Just that you have a general fluctuation theorem uh, for functionals of the form i of u. And epsilon to be uh, what it is, I hope it will be one, I of you minus expectation, I could have a fluctuation result for uh, up to the top height, and now if you want to take pi to the log, uh, and that function of epsilon with the expectation that shows up here. Um, and the way we deal with that pi is that was a nice trick. Uh, that was introduced in that paper I mentioned about the short range case um, is to actually write to use Plato Com to write phi of u as a stochastic integral of this quantity as by this is a mean zero random variable, so it can be written as a stochastic integral. And you have Plato Com that tells you how to do it. Uh, so you use Plato Com to write this as a stochastic integral. Um, and then you use Shine's method. Kind of show that the uh, uh, the quantity that you get in that way. I mean, essentially, you use a sort of homogenization result for the capacity. Uh, that's very easy to identify. But you do once we've written it as a stochastic integral, uh, you can rewrite it in a way that makes that guy show up. 
Um, and then you probably have an entry from the various which are the product of terms of that type. Um, and then you use the fact that in the regime you're interested, these things are well separated, and so in particular, these two guys become almost independent. So you use these sort of properties, <coughs> and then that allows you to get sort of a nice expression for the integrals that you get out of that uh, and then it's just more transition to talk about. Questions? Due to the latest static string from Anderson parabolic model. Um, you can start this on the lattice. With this because we're not. Um, Probably easy. I'm not sure if you can hear anything. Should should be easier. Right? I mean, here yeah, things are smooth, right? But so then it's a small scale structure you can see. Yeah. Well, you don't have uh, grab H, right? I mean, you, you just. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, you see, here you start off from something which has no small yeah, structure sure. either, right? And so. Everything is nice and smooth. So, so just locality is enough. Let's thank Martin again. <laughs> start the next talk when the next talk is ready to start. <laughs> Thank you.